So it's fantastic this evening to welcome Miriam Swanson here uh, with us. Um, I'm Kate Wharton, I'm the vicar of St Bart's Church in Roby in Liverpool and I'm one of the assistant national leaders of New Wine and uh, one of the things that we're trying to do as a church is every Wednesday we're trying to have some sort of activity that we can join in together and occasionally we're trying to invite some special guests and um, some people that we want to hear from that have got some wisdom to share and Miriam's the first of our special guests and um, so this evening we've got an evening with Miriam Swanson all the way from Florida. Miriam thanks so much for being here. You're welcome it's really fun to be here this is a uh... What an excellent community. You lot are rowdy, the ones that I've already heard shouting away. Excellent. Sorry that I'm not in person with you. That would have been extra fun. I know, right? They're making this much noise like on yeah, Zoom. Imagine what it's like on a Sunday in the building or what it would be and will be again when we're in the building again. So um, I'm saying an evening with, but actually it's not an evening. What time is it where you are? Uh, it's nine minutes past three o'clock in the afternoon. Fantastic. And I was saying to you earlier, we've had a really lovely day here today. It's been super sunny, but actually it's not kind of Florida sunny. It's, it's so hot that I now have to sit inside all day to work. It literally at the weekend it shifted and I thought I can't, I can't become a puddle on Zoom for the whole day. So I'm inside now. So yeah, the struggle's real yeah sympathy whatever um so miriam people um some people will know you some of us here have been to new wine um some of us haven't some of us will have heard you speak or heard of you but people might not uh, be up to date with your news and they might think what the heck is she doing in florida so right. what the question. heck are you doing in florida i know right well I'm, I'm i married a bloke from florida didn't i so i had to go and move so um inconvenient i would recommend generally if you are gonna date do it locally because it's far more so much faff but never mind so yeah ben is from florida and uh we've started married life here in a city called jacksonville um which is actually really near the beach um it's a big old city but it's uh it's big, it's big enough that I don't really feel like I'm in a city. So don't get the picture in your head that I'm in an American city. I'm basically in a small beach town that happens to have a university nearby and a local church down the road that we're part of. So yeah, I've been here, um, I don't know, eight months, something like that. And I currently can't go home in terms of the UK. So um, I, it seems like I'm just stuck here, everyone. What can you do? Yeah, it's a bit of a crazy time to have made an international move, isn't it? <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, like wasn't quite deliberate. I mean, let's be honest, none of us planned what's going on at the moment, did we, team? Like, we're all a bit surprised. Um, so, yeah, and yeah, I'm really I'm, keen to come on holiday. I know, so. I know. I know. I've actually, that's one of the blessings of life. It's like nobody can get here. <laughs> quite rude. <laughs> I know, just gate crash our beach. No, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a funny time. So what's it like? So over here, we are fairly locked down. Um, we can't gather together in church. We can't meet together with other people apart from like one in a park. And that's only recently, it, you know, it's pretty locked down over here. What's, what's life like over there? So I've tried to describe this to my American community and basically explained that uh, we are just experiencing social distancing. Like when, when they were using the terminology lockdown here, my understanding being you know on the phone to my family and my friends in england was oh, okay it's nothing like you're experiencing partly because the uk is that bit smaller um and uh and you're kind of being led very clearly around stay at home protect the nhs save lives you know so there's a very clear instruction and it's a small enough country that you guys actually do kind of have to keep yourselves to yourselves america is so big 50 states is, a, is basically the equivalent of 50 countries. They just happen to be all called the United States of America. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm learning. And so what it means is in my bit of Florida, which is massive, like the, however long it would take me to drive Florida, I'd be in the sea if I was driving that distance in England, right? Florida, my area, very low case rate. So yes, we've been social distancing and I've been particularly careful because I'm in touch with the UK, so I know how serious this is. But honestly, I keep explaining to my friends here, you don't know how you don't know how far this has gone in other places. Like if you are worried that you might have to queue at a grocery store, I'm like, it's a different league at home. So in some ways that's a blessing, but in other ways it, it I am aware that I'm not sure everyone knows how real this is. Mm -hmm. Whereas England, I know you know how real this pandemic is and how seriously we have to take it. So I'm being affected by England in my response, being far more cautious around social distancing, I'd say. 
Sure, sure. And you, um, you're working over there, you're doing kind of the same job that you were here. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've had a bit of a funny season in the sense that um, when we got married, I wasn't allowed to work for a little bit. So um, the last sort of four months I've been Not on a sabbatical. Ben didn't let you, just to be clear. Yeah, no. Oh yeah, gosh, no. He literally chained me to the kitchen sink and said, you're going to... No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, legally, I have to have a work permit if I'm going to stay and work in America. And so I had to apply for that. That took a few months. And so I actually had a sabbatical because I couldn't work. Uh, the blessing of that is I've actually done my whole 20s in ministry. So actually taking a bit of time off is no bad thing anyway. And actually quite a natural thing for lots of sort of church leaders to do at around the 10 year mark. So what I found very strange was my visa came back saying, okay, you can start working again. And I work for a charity called Fusion. So we help local churches really support and reach university students and like help university students find home in local church and meet Jesus. Um, I started working for Fusion as lots of people had to stop work and so I got permission to work as a bunch of people had to suddenly take an enforced sabbatical like some of my friends on furlough in England I'm like gosh I've just had a I've had I've just had to have a sabbatical I've just had an enforced sort of legally you're not allowed to work and that's what furlough is for a lot of people so I'm actually finding myself in quite a few conversations about how to make the most of being forced on sabbatical and how that can be a gift as well as a challenge yeah yeah fantastic thank you and um before you moved to florida you were living in middlesbrough that's, that's the, mighty move. Move. The, the mighty borough um and i know that that was also a very god move for you wasn't it so can you just tell us a little bit about how it is that you came to move from york to middlesbrough what that kind of journey was like um that was one of the biggest and best things I've ever done in terms of my understanding and transformation of like who I am in Jesus was moving from beautiful York to extra beautiful Middlesbrough um it was uh to be honest that process had been going on a while uh, in my 20s about thinking what does it mean as a follower of Jesus to live the kind of life that only makes sense if the Holy Spirit's real how do I not look just the same as everybody else apart from maybe I, I don't know I swear less and I've got better manners or whatever somebody thinks a Christian is right and I thought gosh that's very dull isn't it like if Jesus is actually alive and Christ lives in us gosh how does my life look like oh the resurrection happened and like now I have God living in me and so I've been praying and thinking about that for a while. I also know that God's got a special heart for people that um, life hasn't been very easy for them. So I know that God particularly cares about people who were born into poverty, generational addiction and unemployment, where systems are broken and therefore really oppressing people. God, like he really favours people that have had like started 10 steps back from everybody else. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was trying to think about where um where might there be places and spaces where a li little old miriam could fit in and and add something good and where would i learn more about jesus because jesus really cares about people that are often overlooked mm -hmm. and so um to be honest the story that wrecked me and changed my life in a good way was um actually um the story of the good samaritan and uh when somebody basically they asked Jesus, like, what does it mean to love your neighbor? Because he asked, what's the greatest command? You know, love God, love people, like love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself, as if they were your very life, love your neighbor. And someone's like, well, who is my neighbor then? And so then he tells this, you know, classic story that probably lots of us have heard of, of the Good Samaritan and about a guy that basically is the victim of a crime and he ends up beaten up and bleeding out on the side of a very dangerous road. And um, a number of people see him and um, choose to walk, like actually cross the, away from the man that's bleeding out um, and uh, move on, sort of overlook him. And uh, some of the people that you would expect in society to have the role of taking care of the downtrodden are actually some of the people Jesus talks about looking the other way. And then the least likely person that you just think, gosh, well, that would never fit. A Samaritan in the case of Jesus context somebody that really nobody thought very much of at all it's a Samaritan that walks towards the crime scene 
in actually endangers his own life in order to save the life of somebody else mm -hmm. and um picks the man up and basically um pours himself into him in order to see healing and um Dr. Martin Luther King, who was a civil rights activist over here in America, you guys probably heard of him, um, he talked about that parable and he said, the other leaders that walked past that man who was bleeding out, their question was, oh, what would happen to me if I got involved? What would happen to me? And the Samaritan, he was the guy that went, hold on, what would happen to him if I don't get involved? Mm -hmm. And I basically reached this point where I went, if I think the Bible's true, I've actually got to live it. And I actually need to start asking Jesus the very serious question, who is my neighbor? And if that means crossing over the road, or in my case, going up the road by an hour and going to a town that doesn't have, I work in students, Middlesbrough was not known for having resources for churches to reach students, even though they've got like at least 10,000. just began to go, you know what, I want to be the kind of person that sees what Jesus says and puts it into practice. And I am, I'm, I'm in risk of becoming a very comfortable, popular 28 year old. And I don't want that to be the biggest thing about my life. And so uh, just before my 28th birthday, the week of my 28th birthday, actually, I moved up the road on my own, didn't know a soul, prayer walked borough in order to find where to live had absolutely no idea i'd moved into the ghetto like legit even my neighbors were like we're all trying to get out of this postcode what is wrong with you like no one could believe that i picked ts1 but for me i just felt like the holy spirit was like this this estate this road this house now and um and i thought go on then that makes sense if jesus is real and it makes no sense to anybody else I bet, I bet that's him. And I've had the time of my life there. Honestly, changed my life. Um, oh, yeah. I, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my discipleship journey. So there's, there's so much I want to ask you, even just about that story. I, I remember kind of, I remember you making this decision and, and kind of going through all this stuff. It's fantastic. But I, I want to just ask you one, one specific thing before I ask you what it was like to arrive there. And, and it's just because you said, you know, you knew, you, you knew it was TS1, you knew that's the Holy Spirit said this is, how, how, how did you know that? What, what's the process yeah, of question. God speaking to you that meant you knew that? So the truth is when I had Middlesbrough on, in my mind and in my head and in my heart, I actually sat on that for eight months. And um, I don't make decisions on my own, even though um, my whole life up until six months ago, I've not been married, right? So I've had to do life in community and use friends and wise counsel and, and because I, there's, and I think everyone should do that, whether you're married or not, but you don't automatically live with a sounding board. So I actually began to sound out with my best friends and mentors. I'm really thinking that Teesside and Middlesbrough is an area where God really loves and the world overlooks. And I, and I think as a, as a Christian, <laughs> that would be just the kind of place that we should go. And um, I had a couple of friends come and prayer walk with me, a very like, and, and we began to, now it sounds really silly, there was no booming voice, there was no angel. All we did was we tried to pay attention to what we noticed. And we noticed that we were drawn to certain areas and other areas. We just sort of, it just didn't resonate, didn't sort of settle. And then we walked around these towns and then honestly, I prayed through the very spiritual app, Right Move, where you look <laughs> at rentals. And I, we just looked around three or four houses, I shortlisted them and I just went, do you know what, for whatever reason, that's my top choice. And um, and I thought, push the door then. And uh, we, we pushed all four of those doors to look around the houses. One house was in such a, a rough street. The estate agent took one look at me and went, I'm not even going to show you around here in the nicest possible way. I wouldn't walk here. You can't live here. Not with you looking like that. I was like, oh, that's uh, okay. You've got a tattoo up your neck and I'm slightly scared of you. Okay, I believe you. Let's not look around this house. So... I did that. That's called discernment process, right? Where you basically push and work out what am I sensing? What am I seeing? Do I feel peace? Do I feel more anxious? What's settling in me? And then I found this, the house that I had on right move just by praying through and going, hmm, that one's caught my eye. I wonder why. I walked in and went, oh, yeah, that just feels like home. And sometimes you'll get that. Some of you might have found church, for example, because you 
you walked into a small group or a Sunday meeting and went, oh, family here. That's weird. I wonder why. You know, like, I think that often happens with us sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah, that's really helpful. Because I think the reason I asked you that question is because, you know, we're, we're on a bit of a journey here as a, as a church of kind of, there's some people who've had a lot of experience of that in their lives, but there's some of us who are, who are kind of newer to that. And actually the stuff we were doing right up until the lockdown happened and we weren't actually able to finish the course, but we were doing a course where we were kind of ex exploring some of this stuff and we've been looking at how do we hear God's voice and what does it Brilliant. look like when God speaks and we're kind of in the middle of that really of figuring that out for so for some of us that's that's kind of new um and so I just wanted to kind of get you to sort of articulate what that would look like for you um and I know living in Middlesbrough was this huge sort of blessing for you and, you and you met some amazing people and again I wanted to just kind of ask a bit about what did that look like for you in terms of engaging with your neighbours because you know we're, we're here in Liverpool we're we're like a friendly bunch of people like people know their neighbors here they talk to their neighbors that so it's not it's not that thing that you sometimes hear of people don't know the person next door but how do no, we go past just being nice to them and, and just how do we do life together how, and if we're christians how do we how do we share that how do we some people may be nervous about doing that what does that look like yeah you know um partly the truth is because i'd lived on a pretty middle class street in the city center of york People didn't know their neighbours there. And then I moved to Borough and I was the stranger. And this lot, they were loyal family and they weren't sure what to do with me. In fact, they thought I was a police officer, which was a very, very disturbing conversation when that happened. Because I thought, that's me gone then, isn't it? If you think I'm the police, I better ring my mum and say goodbye. <laughs> you know. But um, So in some ways, I learned about love your neighbour from my neighbours. Because I noticed these kiddos running in and out of each other's houses. Um, I, I remember really sadly one of our neighbours died he had a stroke from a roof and um, a building accident and I remember having a real lesson in what it means to love your neighbour and to share which is the kingdom of God um, there's this phrase around the kingdom of God when people at the church together we have everything in common we actually it's not mine and yours it's ours like there's this kind of principle of if you need something and I have something we share like that's what the family does and I saw that in Middlesbrough without them being Christians or anything. Um, this guy died and they couldn't afford the funeral. And then one of my other neighbours just turned around and I said, you know, like, what do we need to do? And he went, well, we'll do what we always do. We'll have a whip round. We'll put our money together and we'll send them off properly because when that's what we do, isn't it? We'll, we always find a way together. And I thought, that is what we should do, love. But I think like, you've taught me more about church just then. Mm. <laughs> and the fact that you together managed to see this guy do his memorial service so there are some ways in which i learned about love your neighbor from them and like my my muslim neighbors next door in in the in the muslim um faith there they also believe in love your neighbor and so if any of you guys have had the, actually the privilege of being in a diverse or faith community it might well be that you have received a really good meal that you could never make like my pakistani just on point spicy rice I could never make that, but they they greeted me with food sometimes. So there were ways in which um, I learned about love your neighbour from my from them. But there were things that I knew, despite feeling totally ill-equipped and unqualified to be. Uh, you know, I'm from the south. I've got a degree. I do not currently have an addiction to drugs. There was a few things going on that meant I I was an alien creature to them alien but I thought as a Christian I know the Holy Spirit in me is for everybody he's like the best translator of my posh accent and my privileged background he's the best translator and so I just thought well you know what I can offer is I can offer prayer and so when there was a big fight on the street and two of the women fell out big time and they're both like crying on their doorsteps and they won't forgive each other I thought, well, you, what's the job of a Christian? Well, we, Jesus talks about us being um, in the ministry of reconciliation, like bringing God to people and people back to God and people back to people and unity. So I thought, right, walked down the road, sat down next to my neighbours, crying her eyes out, listened. And partly she just needed to be listened to, if I'm honest. She just feels like nobody listens to her in her life. And then I said, I'm going to pray for you. Is that OK? And she leant into me like lent into this prayer hug and then I just spoke words of life over her and I thought now that I've never seen on this street 
Like they're very good at banter. They're good at clubbing together. They are not good at verbal encouragement and nobody, nobody offers prayer. So I thought, well, I can offer prayer and I'm going to choose to never join in the street gossip. I'm never going to join in that backbiting because there's quite a lot of that going on. I'm only going to speak hope. And even when, they're, even when someone's done something wrong, I'm going to offer an opinion that could be compassionate around why they might have shouted and had a bad day. And I found like that, that my neighbours began to comment on going, okay, we can trust you because you actually, I've never heard you say anything bad about anybody. I feel like I can trust you. Or do you mind praying because my kid's got a temperature, but we don't want to go to the doctor, you know, some of that stuff. So yeah, encouragement and prayer were, were a huge thing that could show what it meant to live next door to someone that loves Jesus. That's what I found. Yeah. And there's a whole thing in there, isn't there, about just what's different, what's, what's different. So you're, you're, you know, you're being kind. Lots of them are being kind. You're being friendly. Lots right. of them are being friendly. You know, you're, you're looking out for one another. They're all doing that. But there's, what are we bringing that's different? Uh-huh. Um, and, and as you say, people notice that stuff, don't they? Actually, people really do notice how we live. And so if you've never said a bad word about anyone, gosh, right. that's gonna, that's gonna stand out, isn't it? So we, we, we scared. Like, it sounds like, oh, this is great. You went in there, you prayed for everyone. And, you know, but I, I can imagine some people saying, well, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't go up to my neighbour and, you know, give them a hug and pray for them. Oh, yeah, it's bonkers. So partly I just decided, okay, this isn't normal. Some of the things I'm going to do, it's not normal that I'm here, to be honest. Um, so partly I just um, took a deep breath and decided to be brave. Um, because it is scary and I moved onto that street totally sticking out and um, and I thought I could look like a right idiot if I'm like the only neighbour that's talkative or something but I just decided in my heart and in my head Miriam what do you want it to be like to live next door to you because whatever that street culture's been when you move in there's an there's something new there and so you've got this window of opportunity to go okay what's it like to live next to Miriam? And I thought, okay, I'm going to be the kind of neighbour that knows your name and that is at least bothered to ask how you're doing today. So there was a couple of things I just did that was very, that was brave. And I, I'm saying that not to blow my own trumpet but because it took bravery. And so I, I did take a deep breath and knock on next door and introduce myself. And that is scary, even for an extrovert like me. I also made up fun excuses to make myself brave. For example, it was my birthday a few days after I moved to Middlesbrough. So I just decided, literally just invented the tradition of when it's my birthday, everyone gets donuts. So I bought loads of donuts and then I door knocked and went, hey, it's my birthday. Have a donut. As a way to meet people using the excuse that it was actually my birthday. Um, same thing at Christmas, you know, um, I had everybody over or at least invited everyone over. Not everyone came, thank goodness. That would have been chaos. Um, and I just went, oh, like it's Christmas. So we write down our prayers at Christmas. So then everyone's like, oh yeah, okay. Wrote down a prayer. I'm like, brilliant. We've actually just begun praying there. That's weird. On Advent, I took my friends and their kids to my mum's just to be in the countryside because that's that would be new for them. And um, we talked about like what Advent means in terms of the beginning of this journey towards the story of Jesus arriving. And so pancake day, you, you name it team, make up a thing. You know, like I just found excuses to be brave and I used some of the cultural things that were going on anyway as an opportunity rather than to ignore them, but to, as an opportunity to connect in some way. Christmas cards, even like moving to Florida here, Again, just had to be really brave, took a deep breath and decided, honestly, just one afternoon, I just decided I'm going to have to knock on doors and say hello to people because this isn't the kind of street where people are doing that. And so, um, and then I invited people around for like coffee and donuts again. There's a theme developing here <laughs> around donuts now that I'm thinking of it. I mean, that's so um, strange because from all that I know of you, I would never imagine that you would wait a minute, no. <laughs> no, no, wait, I've got a really sweet food. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I just, um, I just made excuses to do that. But also, you know, sometimes I, I um, just said to the Holy Spirit, I, I literally prayed. I was driving back home one day and I said, Jesus, I don't know how to meet more of my neighbours. Please can some more be outside that I've not met before. 
when I get home. And I pulled up in the car and I met seven new people who just happened to be kicking outside and the, some kids playing football and stuff. And I'm like, oh, awkward prayer works. Like I totally forgot to ask. Like, so I, I would encourage you sometimes just to pray really simple prayers like Jesus, yeah. you meet somebody today. You know? I love that. And I, I love that. I love this that you're calling that a simple prayer. Um, and, it, and it is a simple prayer, but actually sometimes those are the, those are the prayers we forget to pray, aren't they? I, so today, yeah. as it happens, I've recorded my sermon for Sunday, um, which is about, which is John 17, which is Jesus praying. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I've looked in that, it's why it's in my mind about, you know, what is, how, what's the model for Jesus praying? And actually, sometimes it is just those really simple prayers, isn't it? It's just saying the thing to God that you're asking for. Um, and actually, those prayers are, are simple, but but they're, they're bold, aren't they, as well? Because like right. you say, if you know some that's dangerous prayers aren't there like if i was going to say the trouble, do it. right the trouble is if you ask for it and then you do see seven neighbors out on the street it's so much more tempting to just go in your house close the door be like i'm done it's the end of the day and so that's when you've got to be brave and go hello how you doing what's your name you playing football brilliant who do you support yeah and just beginning to make those connections and actually to be honest if any of you guys live in contexts like the borough and I know Liverpool and I know, know some of the different spaces there you know that behind closed doors there's always stuff going on that's actually quite hard and you know that in some situations people are very slow to trust with what's really going on but if you're the kind of person that's consistently gone how you doing today you you doing all right yeah just checking in it means on the day where they're not doing well and they can't fake it you've actually become a safe person and so just now and again that's when I felt like gosh thank you Jesus that I'm on this street because there were a few moments where I might have been the only person that got that story and that was a very, very important thing for that person to have shared out loud as part of their kind of processing of trauma or something difficult that happened um, and even being a safe place for some of the kids they just knew that they could sit on my doorstep and I'd come and sit with them and listen to how, you know, if, when they got kicked out of school and stuff, I wanted to be the kind of person that would listen to actually ha what had happened from their point of view. And like, I bought them like reading books and stuff because they weren't getting read to at home and that sort of stuff can really affect you when you're like seven to eight to nine years old. So I just don't know, in little ways, I tried to think like, what would bring life to the people around me? And how, what do I learn about Jesus from living amongst people not like me? And it, it goes both yeah. ways. Yeah, and I love that because I love that earlier, you, you know, you talked about what sort of neighbour would I want to have? And, you know, that sense of, of kind of being Jesus-like in, in a place, you know, it's not kind of, it's not about inviting Jesus in because he's already there, but it's about just thinking, what does it look like in this moment? There's something about just the everyday, isn't there? You know, it's not right. making this a special out there thing, but just every day in the in the going to work and the walking down the street and the talking to the neighbor and what you know it's that that jesus at work in the everyday thing isn't it exactly and just um even just like silly things that are really big things but hanging out with them when they had a party but just being the one person that didn't get drunk and then them going oh so what do you do on a friday night or like the fact that this was really like you know, even just the way that I'd speak well of my parents, for example, or the way that I would, um, they, they just got to watch my everyday life. And there was a few little lifestyle differences that made them pay attention. And, but you know what, I don't know whether Liverpool's like this, but Borough was really like this. Because there's not a culture of encouragement, people don't tell you. I basically, I had no idea whether my, I, me living there was making any difference to anyone else or whether it was just me doing all the learning and no one else really caring mm -hmm. and um what i noticed was the way that people insulted or affirmed each other was how they spoke about their kids it was never direct so if i lived next to kate i would never say kate you are really brilliant at being a friend but i would say kate i really like the way that you've um made the church notice board so incredibly artistic what a helpful thing i would never directly i'd have to comment something you've done not you mm -hmm. and so um i just noticed that and so it was really funny because i didn't know whether they cared that i was there until ben who i'm now married to came to visit and they met ben from florida who was like a 
God bless him, it was like a circus animal. Like he was just paraded. Anybody that walked down our street, particularly when he had really long hair, he looked like Jesus with an afro. You know, but he was an absolute novelty. No one could understand what an American was doing here, but it was glorious that he was there. Anyway, they would never say any compliment directly to me, but they would say, oh, Ben's like you because Ben really cares about our kids and listening to them and speaking to them too. And I'm like, ah, so you've noticed that I really give your children the time of day. You have never once thanked me for that or mentioned it. But in commenting on something that isn't me, I realise they've noticed. Do you know? So you'll notice ways in which people gradually soften and go, oh, thanks for that. But I've never, they've never directly affirmed me until the day I left. And then we all cried our eyes out. And then, and then they wrote me on Facebook Messenger, beautiful things that they would never say out loud. And I thought, gosh, Jesus, I didn't know whether you were really doing much over the last two years. But he was, he was doing more than we could see. Fantastic. So we've got a few more questions, a few more things that people just want to um, unpick, which uh, is lovely. So there's a few more questions about just how did you, how did you know, <laughs> you know, that kind of calling stuff. So someone's asking, um, how did you know, you, you talked a little bit about being called to um, Middlesbrough, but just how did you know that it was right to move to Middlesbrough? And then someone else has said, how did you know it was right to move to Florida? I mean, I guess that was just because you married Ben, right? But <laughs> um, right. that kind of calling thing. You know, I, th- I think that um, we've, ha- we've had a temptation to get a bit wrapped up in uh, waiting for God to tell me what to do and then I'll go and do it. And I myself have been guilty many times of, of being annoyed with Jesus and being like, if you tell me, then I'll do it. Why aren't you telling me? And the truth is just, I think the majority of the time, God doesn't work like a booming voice and a very clear sign and that uh, you've got almost no choice because he's so clearly robotically told you this this and this so the Middlesbrough thing for example I felt like it was a spark of an idea that I let myself dream and imagine about that became a gentle invitation that became something that I couldn't quite leave alone and in the end genuinely I felt like God said to me I felt myself being uprooted from York physically. That's all the way I can describe it is I just, I just had this feeling of like, Oh, this no longer feels like home. Does that mean I'm moving or does that mean I need to change something else not to do with the location? And it was almost like, um, it was almost like the idea in my head that I, I think was God was Miriam. I am with you. Fact. So I'm, I'm going to bless you because my presence is the blessing with you. Mm-hmm. What would you like to do? So Middlesbrough was not a booming voice. It was a choice. As I chose to move, God then gave me lots of different ways of confirming good plan, Miriam, good choice. Right from the right house through to um, even like somebody praying and getting a prophetic word about you're going to move and it's going to be very quick. And it's going to be like, I had some very specific prophetic words only after I'd chosen Mm -hmm. all the way down to getting the right house at the right time for the right money, all in 24 hours. I moved within, within, uh, I felt on the 1st of August that that I was like, Oh, I've got to go now. And by the 1st of September, I've moved. I was like, Oh gosh, crazy. So um, God's voice I've often found is you beginning to test out ideas in prayer and pushing doors. And often God says, what would you like to do? And as you go, God, I'd really love to give away this much money, but I'm quite scared as to how I can afford to do that. Like I I basically it's experimentation and Mm -hmm. practice, not booming voices and very clear, do this or you'll be disobedient. I just have very, very yeah. little experience on that i think that's really helpful that sense of of you know um just trying to sense it trying to work it out taking a step of faith seeing if you were right and then and then discovering that you were right and that gives you confidence because then you remember back right. how it happened and but sometimes it isn't right but god's always there anyway it's not as if god's going do this and then if you accidentally don't right. it's you kind of all over miss it by trying to follow jesus do you know and, and like god literally says like my sheep know my voice they won't follow a strangers. So I think if you, if you keep sort of in conversation with Jesus and with Jesus people around you, I don't think you're going to make this huge mistake and miss the plan for your life. I don't think it's like that. Mm. You know, York, the reason I went to York is because I didn't get into university to where I wanted to go. 
And so I took a year out that I wasn't expecting, reapplied for uni, got into York and just went, oh, I didn't even look at York first time round. Ended up in York and that changed my life for loads of reasons, including that's how I discovered Fusion and have ended up in this job for, for like 10 years of student mission and helping lead the church G2 that I was part of. But um, Florida, oh my goodness, guys, I didn't want to be called to America. The UK is amazing because the spirit of God is moving so amazingly in unity and across the church in Europe. That felt really costly to leave. But I did feel like it was the right thing, the right invitation of Jesus to marry Ben. And so Ben and I both had to put on our table our plan for our life and go, God, you can have it. We, we can both quit our jobs if you want to, Jesus. We can both quit our communities. Like, what would you have us do? And honestly, the decision to move to Florida was much more to do with some real practical wise things. Like, I can work for Fusion for anywhere in the world because I was already doing international stuff. Okay, and Ben is a campus minister on a specific campus. Very different. Also, his family had some real health issues and we needed to be closer because his dad was in bad health. Okay, that's just a very practical thing. We need to be all hands on deck. And a very few practical things made us go, actually, we need to take care of the people God's asked us to take care of. And um, Ben was part of a church for 20 years that was really well set up to support the first years of marriage. And that was... I was helping lead like young adult stuff, just getting going where I was. So I thought I actually need to be where there are more married couples that are like 10 years ahead of us because mm-hmm. I'm going to need some help here. And that wasn't Middlesbrough at that time for me. Yeah. So some, some things about that just sound very normal. And I yeah. think Jesus is in those normal things too, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It can be, all become a bit sort of overly spiritual sometimes. Right. Like, it's practical stuff as well. Yeah. So someone's asked a great question here, which is about, you know, when you got to Middlesbrough, you, you've talked about this great community that you became a part of and what you learned from them. You've talked about kind of living a bit differently, but where did you, where was God already at work? What did you notice in that place that God was already doing? So, like I said, um, as much as it sounds like a cliche, I learned more about Jesus from what I found in Middlesbrough in and outside the church than I think I shared Jesus. Um, So I learned about kingdom unity because the unity in Middlesbrough between the churches is extraordinary and has been for years. They're doing, they are way ahead of the curve in terms of praying together and doing events and mission together. And so I learned a lot about, it's not about individual churches. So like when we did student mission in Middlesbrough, we did it with six or seven churches and there wasn't a single church brand or name involved. You wouldn't have known that I was part of St Barnabas. And you wouldn't have known that they were part of new generation. You wouldn't have known. I thought, gosh, I learned a lot about not competing, Mm -hmm. but laying down everyone else's ideas in order to serve people that don't know Jesus together. Um, And like I said, I learned a lot about hospitality from my Muslim neighbors because um, they, they fed me more than anyone. (laughs) Um, And, and just, I suppose around, I've never met such brave and resilient people I basically have a huge, greater respect for how strong people are and how brave they are and how courageous people are who have generationally started on the back foot. Not their fault, just to start on the back foot because their, their dad lost their job when they closed the factories. And so they started on the back foot with a house that didn't have an income. And just realising, oh man, uh, like that people are extraordinary and I have so much respect for people that start in a hard time and make the best of what they've got so um Mm -hmm. yeah like I say I I, it really wasn't about me I just had to work out because I have Jesus in me does he make any difference and so that's where some of those spiritual experiments happened around can can anyone see Jesus in me because I feel like I'm seeing him all over you guys do you know yeah and so you've so you've just described that you know living in York and that kind of wasn't really what you intended and it was kind of this quite nice little you know it was amazing and then you've got Middlesbrough and then you've got Florida and they're all quite different um (laughs) and you know in each of those at, at some point in time you've been the outsider you've been the new person so uh there's that sort of to contend with um mm-hmm. but actually somebody's kind of asking me here you know is is it easier to be bold in a new place with new people you know than with you know when you're the outsider is it almost if people have been living next to their neighbor for 20 years and they suddenly want to start right so this is much harder 
with my friends that I've been friends with since I was seven. So my school friends. So that the great challenge of that, if anyone's been friends with anybody for any length of time, you know that you can't do, I've met you for the first time. This is what it's like to meet me. When you've been friends for a very long time, sharing our faith can feel very tiring because you haven't seen breakthrough. And you just go, gosh, like they've heard it all before, surely. It's not worked. I just don't really know what to do now. Or it's too awkward to mention my faith now because I've known them for too long and not really said anything. The truth is there are actually always more opportunities than we realise to share Jesus in ways that are very natural and actually all to do with being a good friend. So, for example, um, you know, my school friends, when some of them went through big life challenges, I just decided, even though they've known me for 20, what, 25 years and never been interested in Jesus for themselves, if a crisis happens for them, like when a parent got diagnosed with cancer, I still... It was hard, but I did say, I actually don't know what else to say at this moment. Can I just pray for you on the phone? And I thought, I never want to get tired of believing Jesus is real and really cares about them, even if for 25 years, that's not been something they've wanted more of. They've also never rejected me for following Jesus. They've actually just respected the fact that I've been consistent, that I do love him and that he is, like, he is wrapped up in who I am. And so with my school friends and people that I've known for decades, I, ha I have to think of like opportunities that are natural. And even, you know, in, in the pandemic, that's a real opportunity to offer prayer again. That's a real opportunity to invite people to try church online because it's all new and it's all a bit weird. And if we're in such a weird time, we can kind of go, hey, you know, that like 25% of the UK are tuning into church on Sundays. Have you tried that yet? Like, you should. Ours is a bit chaos, but you should. Because the coffee thing afterwards is quite funny. You know, I just think you actually do have an opportunity. And if you do that scary prayer of Holy Spirit, will you give me a natural opportunity to share my faith? He actually does. But if you pray it, then unfortunately, then you have an opportunity and you might not want one really. <laughs> yeah, it's like dangerous praying again. Yeah, um, so yeah, you kind of started to answer the next question then, which somebody has been asking, you know, just what, what does this look down like in lockdown? Um, you know, so what is, what is, talking to your neighbours and showing faith that I can lock down but also church in this way so as you say in some ways there's loads more opportunities at the moment actually and we're you know and but in some ways it's a lot harder isn't it yeah I think we've got a unique opportunity that people don't need to have already gone through all those big barriers of I'm going to have to travel somewhere to a building that I don't know I'm going to have to be the first to walk into a space without knowing whether I'll know anybody. I then hope I get talked to, but equally don't want to be spoken to. And then I don't know what to expect. And then I don't know whether I can leave, which might be someone's experience on a Sunday meeting in a church building if they're just going to wander in. In watching um, Kate's talk that she's prepared for Sunday, you've got a taste without actually anybody needing to watch your face to see what you're thinking. Then if you decide, um oh that's quite interesting actually you could hop on the coffee morning afterwards you could connect into your midweek event and activity but all of it i think a bunch of barriers have actually been broken down a bunch of excuses for why i'm just too scared to go on my own none of us are going together right now all of us are meeting online from separate locations so i think you have got an opportunity to say oh i would just try it see what you think because it's like no one need know. Like, you don't even need to put your camera on if you don't want to. Like, you could just listen in and see what you think. So I, I do think there's a real opportunity for evangelism there. Along with, you know, I've seen lots of people just say, hey, I really believe God's real and that he cares about what's going on in our lives. If anyone's got anything they'd like me to pray for, I'm going to be praying for people today on my social media. Just drop me a message or a comment and I'll pray for you too. And actually, we've had lots of stories of students having phenomenal conversations with friends about faith because they just threw out the prayer thing as well as to be honest um in small groups that have been happening online people who are hungry to like know more they felt way less threatened hopping in on a like a, a call of 10 than they have like going somewhere to someone's house for example for home group or something and we've had students give their lives to jesus but all all online it's like it's a very strange time team but uh it might just be quite good for, for Jesus, like to, for us to get creative in these kind of ways.
Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And, I, and I've had messages from people, you know, from church saying kind of similar things to that family members who wouldn't normally come with them to church, but they were in the room and yeah, it's not funny. Know, kind of pretending not to listen or whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, now I know, because um, you know, I know you well, and we've had some of these conversations. I know that you've had some kind of fun adventures around the place. Um, so I'd love to just hear a couple of your, a couple of your fun stories of times when you know you you've you said earlier this brilliant fl- phrase about living the kind of life that only kind of makes sense if the Holy Spirit's real. Um, have you got like a you know a couple of stories of times when you've just kind of you've had this mad kind of sense from the Holy Spirit? You've you've introduce yourself to someone you've asked if you can pray for someone and you've just seen something i'll tell you what the one that is like terrifying um it's a famous last word story that is always my one that i think of like oh my goodness like that just god just called me up immediately i was on an adventure that fusion invented something called escape and pray and so for a few years what we did was um it's it's bonkers guys i actually don't know how we got away with it insurance wise but we did students could sign up in teams of four pay fusion 100 pounds and we would buy them plane tickets and send them to european destinations but they wouldn't know where they were going until they were at the airport so they'd open an orange envelope in there's plane tickets and then they would go to a university location in europe for two days they had no money no plan no contacts and they basically had to do what Jesus did when he sent out the 72, which was when he said, don't take an extra bag, don't take money, don't take an extra coat, go, pray for where you are, pray blessing on the community. And basically when somebody offers you hospitality, accept it because you're going to need it. Anyway, so I was part of that, which was insane and brilliant because it was one of those things of read the Bible, actually try and live it. Oh my goodness, it, that's mental. And we were walking around downtown Milan and one of my teammates had seen me basically speaking to strangers, no problem. The reason why is because I practiced. Just so you know, it's not like I'm just naturally brave. I've practiced getting over my scaredness and going up to talk to somebody about Jesus. That's just like going to the gym to strengthen a muscle. I've just practiced evangelism. My friend said, Miriam, you clearly have no problem talking to strangers about your faith. Um, What is it that scares you? Because she wanted, along with all of us, we all want to know where you're, you're not superhuman, you're just a human. So how are you really just a human? And I said to her, quite honestly, I was like, oh, mate, honestly, it scares the life out of me if I had to pray for healing for somebody. Like, let's say they had an accident in front of me. That would scare the life out of me. Do you know, it's one thing to pray with another Christian and go, look, we know God heals, yes, and sometimes no, but we, we're, we're called to pray. But when it's someone you don't even know and they're in pain, I was like, that would be a nightmare. No less than 10 minutes later, a bloke falls down the subway stairs and can't walk. Like he's hurt his ankle so badly. And I'm just like, I literally, I've just missed the fall. See him at the bottom. He's sweating with pain. His family are calling. He's on the ground. He can't get up. And because I had just said what I said, I looked at my teammates. She, my mate Joe looked at me and I was like, I'm wearing a t-shirt that says escape and pray for goodness sake. And I just thought, I can't not do something. How embarrassing. Like I can't literally bottle out now. So I went, okay, went down the stairs, said, hello, you know, do you speak English? Of course they don't. We're in Milan. They're like, Italia. And I'm like, what? Oh, what about French? At which point this guy's like, yes, French so I'm like Joe you can translate because she's like fluent in French and I'm like there's no way you're getting out of this like you're part of this problem they find a chair and they carry this guy uh, on this chair so he's got his wife there so we realize the wife's in like a hijab they're a Muslim family there's aunties and uncles everywhere mum dad kid he's sweating with pain he can't move his ankle and I literally said because I was like I don't know how much French Joe really knows right but we're in it now team it's too late so I just announce i am not a doctor right (laughs) and joe's just like translating and he's like this is like so unhelpful whoever you are and i said but i do know jesus and i believe jesus can heal right i said does that i don't know joe's french i said please i looked at his wife i said please can i put my hand on his ankle and pray she said yes so i thought right keep it short Miriam you're already freaking out so I just went pain be gone in the name of Jesus ankle be healed in the name of Jesus 
that was it and my heart is going right because I don't even have faith for this really do you know I'm like freaking out I look up at him and the bloke just sort of pauses and we're all quiet now because we're like a bit mad and then I'm and he just looks at me and I'm like well I, I just don't know what to say so I'm like stand up so he sort of stands up gingerly and I'm like oh gosh well he's standing that's an improvement and I thought well I've got to test it it's like walk so he begins to walk and he sort of does this sort of gingerly like walking then realizes he's totally healed starts running up and down the platform going yeah yeah at which point I'm like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Because I'm like, I don't know what else to say. Do you know what I mean? Because I can't like explain the whole gospel in French. So I'm like, Jesus heals or something. And then, and then his wife's like, photo. So then we've got this huge family photo with this guy front and center pointing at his leg. I've still got the photo and we're all just standing there around it like, ba -ba 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 -ba. we've got no idea what happened. I can't believe it. I've prayed for Christians. I've prayed for housemates. I don't understand. Sometimes I see healing, sometimes I don't. And in that moment, I was like, well, that does not make sense unless Jesus is alive. And isn't that just like God, that he would go and choose somebody who knows about him from their religion, but doesn't necessarily know him? Wouldn't it be just like God to use a bloke that can't even speak the language? And he goes and encounters a Muslim guy in Milan station just after I've said I don't really have faith for it. So I'm like, okay, that story reminds me every time I get scared to pray, Miriam, you are not in charge of the results. You're not in charge, but you can just open the door and at least offer to pray. That story is the one that keeps me remembering, hold on, this stuff's crazy and it's not all on me. You can just try. I, I do love that story. I, I do love it. I love it because I can so imagine, well, you can imagine everything about like, it. freaking out, right? So <laughs> very much. Um, but, but I love it as well because I love, I love, that it's another dangerous prayer um, but I love that you were brave enough to go and do it but I love that you're honest enough to say you were scared you know all of that is, is, oh, yeah, is fantastic um, and so somebody's asking you know on the days that were hard I guess you know in, in Middlesbrough or whatever you, you've described the, the, the great bits the kind of the getting to know people and the sharing but actually there must have been some times when it was really tough you didn't know anyone what 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 kept you going when that was really hard yeah I think um it sort of doesn't really matter where we are. We're all going to hit days where um, even if you're living with a bunch of housemates, you can feel on your own. Uh, and even when um, you're really busy doing lots of important things for work or for family or something, you can still feel, gosh, am I doing anything that really counts? Like, does it, Jesus, is this what I was made for? And so uh, that was true. That's been true in every season of life that I've had these moments of wandering God, are we like am I is this worth it like is this making sense um and I think you know partly the the just having a really honest relationship with Jesus he's not afraid of your questions and your doubts he's not afraid of your worst days your darkest days and your lonely days and he's not taking his eyes off you he's, he's kind but he's he's there and so I just recognized um I just I just don't want to keep anything from him even when what I'm vocalizing is I feel really on my own I don't really know what to do I don't really like Middlesbrough oh it just breaks my heart I don't know what it's going to take to be the kind of church that can really help systems of addiction and poverty get broken I just think it's so much bigger you know partly the way I keep going is you love the person in front of you and you say yes to the thing in front of you that's actually how you keep going day by day is you don't get overwhelmed by the big story that's so unjust and messy. You just love the person in front of you as if they were Jesus and you love them and love them and love them. But I did get overwhelmed moments where I went, I don't, I'm, I hate, I hate that this town has felt so trodden on for years and I don't know what to do. And in those moments, I've just found honesty with Jesus and then being able to speak to good friends who remind me who I am, who just go, Miriam, you're not Jesus. You can't fix everything. You know, uh, yes, it is hard. A bit like that, you know, that classic story everyone says when there's a kid throwing starfish back into the water and there's millions of starfish on the beach and they're like, well, what difference are you really making? And they go, well, made a difference to that one. I think just having a few friends that go, you make a difference to one then. Don't, like that street's different though, isn't it? Because at least you're, you're there when there's that big domestic fight and you're there for the kids when they get scared. 
And so I try to focus on the little things, the small things, and be really honest to Jesus about all the big things that I don't understand. Mm. Um, and recognize that emotions are a bit like weather. So the storm does pass, and there will be something that like brings a beam of sunlight because God will offer you little flags that go, Hey, I am still on the move. You are still very deliberate. you like, your life does matter. He will give you little like sunbeams, even if you're in the middle of a storm that lasts for months and you go, I don't really see what's happening. So I try to look out for the little signs of life that remind me uh, I'm not on my own and my life matters to him. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, and we're, we're nearly, we're nearly at the end. We've nearly run out of time and I'd love you to pray for us if you would, before we finish. But um, I, I, just one final question that I would, I would love to ask. This isn't in the chat because I've asked all the chat questions. So it's good because I get to ask one final one. Um, but I know, cause I can see everybody who's, who's in this chat and, and I, I know almost everybody's story and there's lots of people there who follow Jesus for, you know, the whole of their lives. But I also know that there are some people listening here um, uh, perhaps they're a younger person who's just figuring out kind of life and faith for themselves um, or perhaps there's somebody who's come to faith for the first time or come back to faith kind of fairly recently mm -hmm. and I guess I'd just love to know what what your kind of encouragement would be to them in in kind of what it looks like this kind of Jesus life that they're kind of just stepping into you know um, he is so good and he's so wild Oh, I actually makes me feel emotional even talking to people to know if you've just met him. <sighs> the best person you can ever know in your life is Jesus. And, but he is also wild. Like there are things that he'll ask you to do that you don't even believe. God, you would never ask me to do that. That's too big. That's too amazing. Or little old me, I don't have a voice or I never finished school. How could I dot, dot, dot. And the crazy thing about Jesus is because he made you and because he lives in you, he just doesn't look at you the same way the world has looked at you or the same way that you've been treated or by the standards that social media put on you to tell you what's good or what's popular and what's really lame. Jesus just looks at you with such kind powerful eyes and there will be days that are really hard and there'll be days where you think god's not listening and i haven't heard him speak his promises he hasn't left you even when it feels like he's distant but you won't be bored in this life when you realize what it is to be fully alive in god it's going to cost you more than you ever dared imagine and it's going to be worth so much more than you ever dreamed of um, I've never been bored following Jesus, even when I've been restless or felt a bit confused or he's just too alive to be boring and he's too real to not follow with everything that you've got. So the best thing about being a Christian is knowing Jesus, hands down, hands down. Mate, thank you so much. Um, I, as I said, I'm going to ask you to pray in a minute, but thank you so much. Thank you for uh, giving up your time um, to be with us. Thank you for all that you've shared. Thank you for your heart, your passion, uh, your energy, or the way that you've encouraged us. What a joy um, it's been to hear that um, from you. Um, you know, we're, we're aware that we're really fortunate to have been able to kind of grab you for this time this evening. Um, I'm going to let everybody say a, a noisy, raucous St. Bart's kind of thank you in a minute. But before I unmute... And, and unleash all of that um wouldn't it be great if you would just pray for us would you do that yeah, i'd love to oh holy spirit i thank you that you are in us right now like a burning flame jesus will you fan into flame your presence in us father that each of us might remember we are family because of you we are breathed into life and that you are with us now and Lord, I pray a blessing over this community. Father, I pray for such deep encounter with your love, your protection and your dreams, Father. Lord, may we each step into your creative and wild spirit that is not locked down. God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you call each of us. Father, I ask particularly for breakthrough with neighbours that in this time when we actually really need each other as a society, that these guys would be lights of hope, that they would have breakthroughs, even just miraculous conversations and divine connections 
in just even in the rest of the week that there will be these funny moments of realizing oh that was god tripping into jesus meetings that these guys might be salt and light and hope to a thirsty hungry world that desperately needs to know good news and that good news has a name so father thank you for this community bless them and cover them spur them on give them courage the infilling of your presence in jesus name amen amen 